Chapter 1, The Bride The year that Buttercup was born, the most beautiful woman in the world was a French scullery maid named Annette. Annette worked in Paris for the Duke and Duchess de Guiche, and it did not escape the Duke's notice that someone extraordinary was polishing the pewter. The Duke's notice did not escape the notice of the Duchess, either, who was not very beautiful and not very rich, but plenty smart. The Duchess set about studying Annette, and shortly found her adversary's tragic flaw. Chocolate. Armed now, the Duchess set to work. The Palace de Guiche turned into a candy castle. Everywhere you looked, bonbons. There were piles of chocolate-covered mints in the drawing rooms, baskets of chocolate-covered nuggets in the parlors. Annette never had a chance. Inside a season, she went from delicate to whopping, and the Duke never glanced in her direction without sad bewilderment clouding his eyes. Annette, it might be noted, seemed only cheerier throughout her enlargement. She eventually married the pastry chef, and they both ate a lot until old age claimed them. Things, it might also be noted, did not fare so cheerily for the Duchess. The Duke, for reasons passing understanding, next became smitten with his very own mother-in-law, which caused the Duchess ulcers, only they didn't have ulcers yet. More precisely, ulcers existed, people had them, but they weren't called ulcers. The medical profession at that time called them stomach pains, and felt the best cure was coffee dolloped with brandy twice a day until the pain subsided. The Duchess took her mixture faithfully, watching through the years as her husband and her mother blew kisses at each other behind her back. Not surprisingly, the Duchess's grumpiness became legendary, as Voltaire so ably chronicled. Except this was before Voltaire. The year Buttercup turned ten, the most beautiful woman lived in Bengal, the daughter of a successful tea merchant. This girl's name was Eleuthera, and her skin was of a dusky perfection unseen in India for eighty years. There have only been eleven perfect complexions in all of India since accurate accounting began. Eleuthera was nineteen the year the pox plague hit Bengal. The girl survived, even if her skin did not. When Buttercup was fifteen, Adela Tyrell of Sussex on the Thames was easily the most beautiful creature. Adela was twenty, and so far did she outdistance the world that it seemed certain she would be the most beautiful for many, many years. But then one day, one of her suitors, she had a hundred and four of them, exclaimed that without question Adela must be the most ideal item yet spawned. Adela, flattered, began to ponder on the truth of the statement. That night, alone in her room, she examined herself pore by pore in her mirror. This was after mirrors. It took her until close to dawn to finish her inspection, but by that time it was clear to her that the young man had been quite correct in his assessment. She was, through no real faults of her own, perfect. As she strolled through the family rose gardens watching the sunrise, she felt happier than she had ever been. Not only am I perfect, she said to herself, I am probably the first perfect person in the whole long history of the universe. Not a part of me could stand improving. How lucky I am to be perfect and rich and sought after and sensitive and young and... young? The mist was rising around her as Adela began to think. Well, of course, I'll always be sensitive, she thought, and I'll always be rich, but I don't quite see how I'm going to manage to always be young. And when I'm not young, how am I going to stay perfect? And if I'm not perfect, well, what else is there? What indeed? Adela furrowed her brow in desperate thought. It was the first time in her life her brow had ever had to furrow, and Adela gasped when she realized what she had done, horrified that she had somehow damaged it, perhaps permanently. She rushed back to her mirror and spent the morning, and although she managed to convince herself that she was still quite as perfect as ever, there was no question that she was not quite as happy as she had been. She had begun to fret. The first worry lines appeared within a fortnight, the first wrinkles within a month, and before the year was out, creases abounded. She married soon thereafter, the self-same man who accused her of sublimity, and gave him merry hell for many years. Buttercup, of course, at fifteen, knew none of this, and if she had, would have found it totally unfathomable. How could someone care if she were the most beautiful woman in the world or not? What difference could it have made if you were only the third most beautiful, or the sixth? Buttercup at this time was nowhere near that high, being barely in the top twenty, and that primarily on potential, certainly not on any particular care she took of herself. She hated to wash her face, she loathed the area behind her ears, she was sick of combing her hair and did so as little as possible. 
What she liked to do, preferred above all else, really, was to ride her horse and taunt the farm boy. The horse's name was Horse, Buttercup was never long on imagination, and it came when she called it, went where she steered it, did what she told it. The farm boy did what she told him, too. Actually, he was more a young man now, but he had been a farm boy when, orphaned, he had come to work for her father, and Buttercup referred to him that way still. "'Farm boy, fetch me this. Get me that, farm boy, quickly, lazy thing. Trot now, or I'll tell father.' "'As you wish.' That was all he ever answered. "'As you wish.' "'Fetch that, farm boy, as you wish. Dry this, farm boy, as you wish.' He lived in a hovel out near the animals, and according to Buttercup's mother, he kept it clean. He even read when he had candles. "'I'll leave the lad an acre in my will,' Buttercup's father was fond of saying. They had acres, then. "'You'll spoil him,' Buttercup's mother always answered. "'He's slaved for many years. Hard work should be rewarded.' Then, rather than continue the argument, they had arguments then, too. They would both turn on their daughter. "'You didn't bathe,' her father said. "'I did, I did,' from Buttercup. "'Not with water,' her father continued. "'You reek like a stallion.' "'I've been riding all day,' Buttercup explained. "'You must bathe, Buttercup,' her mother joined in. "'The boys don't like their girls to smell of stables.' "'Oh, the boys!' Buttercup fairly exploded. "'I do not care about the boys. Horse loves me, and that is quite sufficient, thank you.' She said that speech loud, and she said it often. But like it or not, things were beginning to happen. Shortly before her sixteenth birthday, Buttercup realized that it had now been more than a month since any girl in the village had spoken to her. She had never much been close to girls, so the change was nothing sharp, but at least before there were head nods exchanged when she rode through the village or along the cart tracks. But now, for no reason, there was nothing. A quick glance away as she approached, that was all. Buttercup cornered Cornelia one morning at the blacksmith's and asked about the silence. "'I should think after what you've done you'd have the courtesy not to pretend to ask,' came from Cornelia. "'And what have I done?' "'What? What? You've stolen them!' With that, Cornelia fled, but Buttercup understood. She knew who them was. The boys. The village boys. The beef-witted, feather-brained, rattle-skulled, clod-pated, dim-domed, noodle-noggined, sap-headed, lunk-knobbed boys. How could anyone accuse her of stealing them? Why would anybody want them, anyway? What good were they? All they did was pester and vex and annoy. Can I brush your horse, Buttercup? Thank you, but the farm boy does that. Can I go riding with you, Buttercup? Thank you, but I really do enjoy myself alone. You think you're too good for anybody, don't you, Buttercup? No, no, I don't. I just like riding by myself, that's all. But throughout her sixteenth year, even this kind of talk gave way to stammering and flushing, and at the very best, questions about the weather. Do you think it's going to rain, Buttercup? I don't think so. The sky is blue. Well, it might rain. Yes, I suppose it might. You think you're too good for anybody, don't you, Buttercup? No, I just don't think it's going to rain, that's all. At night, more often than not, they would congregate in the dark beyond her window and laugh about her. She ignored them. Usually the laughter would give way to insult. She paid them no mind. If they grew too damaging, the farm boy handled things, emerging silently from his hovel, thrashing a few of them, sending them flying. She never failed to thank him when he did this. As you wish was all he ever answered. When she was almost seventeen, a man in a carriage came to town and watched as she rode for provisions. He was still there on her return, peering out. She paid him no mind, and indeed, by himself he was not important. But he marked a turning point. Other men had gone out of their way to catch sight of her. Other men had even ridden twenty miles for the privilege, as this man had. The importance here is that this was the first rich man who had bothered to do so, the first noble. And it was this man, whose name is lost to antiquity, who mentioned Buttercup to the Count. The land of Florin was set between where Sweden and Germany would eventually settle. This was before Europe. In theory, it was ruled by King Lotharan and his second wife, the Queen. But in fact, the King was barely hanging on, could only rarely tell day from night, and basically spent his time in muttering. He was very old, every organ in his body had long since betrayed him, and most of his important decisions regarding Florin had a certain arbitrary quality that bothered many of the leading citizens. Prince Humperdinck actually ran things. If there had been a Europe, he would have been the most powerful man in it. Even as it was, nobody within a thousand miles wanted to mess with him. 
The Count was Prince Humperdinck's only confidant. His last name was Rugen, but no one needed to use it. He was the only count in the country, the title having been bestowed by the prince as a birthday present some years before, the happening taking place naturally at one of the countess's parties. The countess was considerably younger than her husband. All of her clothes came from Paris. This was after Paris, and she had superb taste. This was after taste, too, but only just, and since it was such a new thing, and since the countess was the only lady in all Florin to possess it, is it any wonder she was the leading hostess of the land? Eventually, her passion for fabric and face paint caused her to settle permanently in Paris, where she ran the only salon of international consequence. For now, she busied herself with simply sleeping on silk, eating on gold, and being the single most feared and admired woman in Florinese history. If she had figure faults, her clothes concealed them. If her face was less than divine, it was hard to tell once she got done applying substances. This was before glamour, but if it hadn't been for ladies like the Countess, there would never have been a need for its invention. In sum, the Rugens were a couple of the week in Florin, and had been for many years. This is me. All abridging remarks and other comments will be in this fancy italic type, so you'll know. When I said at the start that I'd never read this book, that's true. My father read it to me, and I just quick skimmed along, crossing out whole sections where I did the abridging, leaving everything just as it was in the original Morgenstern. This chapter is totally intact. My intrusion here is because of the way Morgenstern uses parentheses. The copy editor at Harcourt kept filling the margins of the galley proofs with questions. How can it be before Europe, but after Paris? And how is it possible this happens before glamour, when glamour is an ancient concept? See glamour in the Oxford English Dictionary. And eventually, I am going crazy. What am I to make of these parentheses? When does this book take place? I don't understand anything. Help! Denise, the copy editor, has done all my books since Boys and Girls Together, and she had never been as emotional in the margins with me before. I couldn't help her. Either Morgenstern meant them seriously, or he didn't. Or maybe he meant some of them seriously, and some others he didn't. But he never said which were the seriously ones. Or maybe it was just the author's way of telling the reader stylistically that this isn't real, it never happened. That's what I think, in spite of the fact that if you read back in Florinese history, it did happen. The facts, anyway. No one can say about the actual motivations. All I can suggest to you is, if the parentheses bug you, don't read them. Quick! Quick! Come! Buttercup's father stood in his farmhouse, staring out the window. Why? This from the mother. She gave way nothing when it came to obedience. The father made a quick finger point. Look! You look! You know how! Buttercup's parents did not have exactly what you might call a happy marriage. All they ever dreamed of was leaving each other. Buttercup's father shrugged and went back to the window. Ah, he said after a while, and a little later again. Ah! Buttercup's mother glanced up briefly from her cooking. Such riches, Buttercup's father said. Glorious. Buttercup's mother hesitated, then put her stew spoon down. This was after stew, but so is everything. When the first man first clambered from the slime and made his first home on land, what he had for supper that first night was stew. The heart swells at the magnificence, Buttercup's father muttered very loudly. What exactly is it, Dumpling? Buttercup's mother wanted to know. You look, you know how, was all he replied. This was their thirty-third spat of the day, this was long after spats, and he was behind, thirteen to twenty, but he had made up a lot of distance since lunch when it was seventeen to two against him. Donkey, the mother said, and came over to the window. A moment later she was going, ah, right along with him. They stood there, the two of them, tiny and odd. From setting the dinner table, Buttercup watched them. They must be going to meet Prince Humperdinck someplace, Buttercup's mother said. The father nodded. Hunting, that's what the prince does. How lucky we are to have seen them pass by, Buttercup's mother said, and she took her husband's hand. The old man nodded. Now I can die. She glanced at him. Don't. Her tone was surprisingly tender, and probably she sensed how important he really was to her, because when he did die two years further on, she went right after, and most of the people who knew her well agreed it was the sudden lack of opposition that undid her. Buttercup came close and stood behind them, staring over them, 
and soon she was gasping too because the count and countess and all their pages and soldiers and servants and courtiers and champions and carriages were passing by the cart track in front of the farm the three stood in silence as the procession moved forward buttercup's father was a tiny mutt of a man who had always dreamed of living like the count he had once been two miles from where the count and prince had been hunting and until this moment that had been the high point of his life he was a terrible farmer and not much of a husband either there wasn't really much in this world he excelled at, and he could never quite figure out how he happened to sire his daughter, but he knew deep down that it must have been some kind of wonderful mistake, the nature of which he had no intention of investigating. Buttercup's mother was a gnarled shrimp of a woman, thorny and worrying, who had always dreamed of somehow just once being popular, like the countess was said to be. She was a terrible cook, an even more limited housekeeper, how Buttercup slid from her womb was, of course, beyond her. But she had been there when it happened. That was enough for her. Buttercup herself, standing half a head over her parents, still holding the dinner dishes, still smelling of horse, only wished that the great procession wasn't quite so far away, so she could see if the Countess's clothes really were all that lovely. As if in answer to her request, the procession turned and began entering the farm. Here? Buttercup's father managed. "'My God, why?' Buttercup's mother whirled on him. "'Did you forget to pay your taxes?' This was after taxes, but everything is after taxes. Taxes were here even before stew. "'Even if I did, they wouldn't need all that to collect them.' And he gestured toward the front of his farm, where now the count and countess and all their pages and soldiers and servants and courtiers and champions and carriages were coming closer and closer. "'What could they want to ask me about?' he said. "'Go see! Go see!' Buttercup's mother told him. "'You go, please. No, you. Please. We'll both go.' They both went, trembling. "'Cows,' the Count said when they reached his golden carriage. "'I would like to talk about your cows.' He spoke from inside, his dark face darkened by shadow. "'My cows?' Buttercup's father said. Yes. You see, I'm thinking of starting a little dairy of my own, and since your cows are known throughout the land as being Florin's finest, I thought I might pry your secrets from you. My cows? Buttercup's father managed to repeat, hoping he was not going mad. Because the truth was, and he knew it well, he had terrible cows. For years, nothing but complaints from the people in the village. If anyone else had had milk to sell, he would have been out of business in a minute. Now, granted, things had improved since the farm boy had come to slave for him. No question, the farm boy had certain skills, and the complaints were quite non-existent now. But that didn't make his the finest cows in Florin. Still, you didn't argue with the Count. Buttercup's father turned to his wife. What would you say my secret is, my dear? he asked. Oh, there are so many, she said. She was no dummy, not when it came to the quality of their livestock. You two are childless, are you? the Count asked then. "'No, sir,' the mother answered. "'Then let me see her,' the Count went on. "'Perhaps she will be quicker with her answers than her parents.' "'Buttercup,' the father called, turning. "'Come out, please.' "'How did you know we had a daughter?' Buttercup's mother wondered. "'A guess. I assumed it had to be one or the other. "'Some days I'm luckier than—' "'He simply stopped talking to them. "'Because Buttercup moved into view, hurrying from the house to her parents.' "'The Count left the carriage.' Gracefully, he moved to the ground and stood very still. He was a big man, with black hair and black eyes and great shoulders and a black cape and gloves. "'Curtsy, dear,' Buttercup's mother whispered. Buttercup did her best. And the Count could not stop looking at her. Understand now, she was barely rated in the top twenty. Her hair was uncombed, unclean. Her age was just seventeen, so there was still in occasional places the remains of baby fat. Nothing had been done to the child. Nothing was really there but potential. But the Count still could not rip his eyes away. "'The Count would like to know the secrets behind our cow's greatness, is that not correct, sir?' Buttercup's father said. The Count only nodded, staring. Even Buttercup's mother noted a certain tension in the air. "'Ask the farm boy. He tends them,' Buttercup said. "'And is that the farm boy?' came a new voice from inside the carriage. Then the Countess's face was framed in the carriage doorway. Her lips were painted a perfect red, her green eyes lined in black. 
All the colors of the world were muted in her gown. Buttercup wanted to shield her eyes from the brilliance. Buttercup's father glanced back toward the lone figure peering around the corner of the house. It is. Bring him to me. He is not dressed properly for such an occasion, Buttercup's mother said. I have seen bare chests before, the countess replied. Then she called out, You, and pointed at the farm boy, come here. Her fingers snapped on here. The farm boy did as he was told. And when he was close, the countess left the carriage. When he was a few paces behind Buttercup, he stopped, head properly bowed. He was ashamed of his attire, worn boots and torn blue jeans. Blue jeans were invented considerably before most people suppose, and his hands were tight together in almost a gesture of supplication. Have you a name, farm boy? Wesley, countess. Well, Wesley, perhaps you can help us with our problem, she crossed to him. The fabric of her gown grazed his skin. We are all of us here passionately interested in the subject of cows. We are practically reaching the point of frenzy such as our curiosity. Why do you suppose, Wesley, that the cows of this particular farm are the finest in all Florin? What do you do to them? I just feed them, Countess. Well then, there it is. The mystery is solved. The secret. We can all rest. Clearly the magic is in Wesley's feeding. Show me how you do it, would you, Wesley? Feed the cows for you, Countess? Bright lad. When? Now will be soon enough. She held out her arm to him. Lead me, Wesley. Wesley had no choice but to take her arm. Gently. It's behind the house, madam. It's terrible muddy back there. Your gown will be ruined. I wear them only once, Wesley, and I burn to see you in action. So off they went to the cowshed. Throughout all this, the Count kept watching Buttercup. I'll help you, Buttercup called after Wesley. Perhaps I'd best see just how he does it, the Count decided. Strange things are happening, Buttercup's parents said, and off they went too, bringing up the rear of the cow-feeding trip, watching the Count, who was watching their daughter, who was watching the Countess, who was watching Wesley. I couldn't see what he did that was so special, Buttercup's father said. He just fed them. This was after dinner now, and the family was alone again. They must like him personally. I had a cat once that only bloomed when I fed him. Maybe it's the same kind of thing. Buttercup's mother scraped the stew leavings into a bowl. Here, she said to her daughter, Wesley's waiting by the back door, take him his dinner. Buttercup carried the bowl, opened the back door. Take it, she said. He nodded, accepted, started off to his tree stump to eat. I didn't excuse you, farm boy, Buttercup began. He stopped, turned back to her. I don't like what you're doing with horse. What you're not doing with horse is more to the point. I want him cleaned. Tonight. I want his hoofs varnished. Tonight. I want his tail plated and his ears massaged. This very evening. I want his stable spotless. Now. I want him glistening, and if it takes you all night, it takes you all night. As you wish. She slammed the door and let him eat in darkness. I thought horse had been looking very well, actually, her father said. Buttercup said nothing. You yourself said so yesterday, her mother reminded her. I must be overtired, Buttercup managed. The excitement at all. Rest then, her mother cautioned. Terrible things can happen when you're overtired. I was overtired the night your father proposed. Thirty-four to twenty-two and pulling away. Buttercup went to her room. She lay on her bed. She closed her eyes. And the Countess was staring at Wesley. Buttercup got up from bed. She took off her clothes. She washed a little. She got into her nightgown. She slipped between the sheets, snuggled down, closed her eyes. The Countess was still staring at Wesley. Buttercup threw back the sheets, opened her door. She went to the sink by the stove and poured herself a cup of water. She drank it down. She poured another cup and rolled its coolness across her forehead. The feverish feeling was still there. How feverish? She felt fine. She was seventeen and not even a cavity. She dumped the water firmly into the sink, turned, marched back to her room, shut the door tight, and went back to bed. She closed her eyes. The Countess would not stop staring at Wesley. Why? Why in the world would the woman in all the history of Florin, who was in always perfect, be interested in the farm boy? Buttercup rolled around in bed. 
and there simply was no other way of explaining that look. She was interested. Buttercup shut her eyes tight and studied the memory of the Countess. Clearly something about the farm boy interested her. Facts were facts. But what? The farm boy had eyes like the sea before a storm, but who cared about eyes? And he had pale blonde hair, if you liked that sort of thing. And he was broad enough in the shoulders, but not all that much broader than the Count. And certainly he was muscular, but anybody would be muscular who slaved all day. And his skin was perfect and tan, but that came again from slaving, in the sun all day, who wouldn't be tan? And he wasn't that much taller than the Count either, although his stomach was flatter, but that was because the farm boy was younger. Buttercup sat up in bed. It must be his teeth. The farm boy did have good teeth, give credit where credit was due, white and perfect, particularly set against the sun-tanned face. Could it have been anything else? Buttercup concentrated. The girls in the village followed the farm boy around a lot whenever he was making deliveries, but they were idiots, they followed anything. And he always ignored them because if he'd ever opened his mouth they would have realized that was all he had, just good teeth. He was, after all, exceptionally stupid. It was really very strange that a woman as beautiful and slender and willowy and graceful, a creature as perfectly packaged, as supremely dressed as the Countess, should be hung up on teeth that way. Buttercup shrugged. People were surprisingly complicated, but now she had it all diagnosed, deduced, clear. She closed her eyes and snuggled down and got all nice and comfortable, and people don't look at other people the way the Countess looked at the farm boy because of their teeth. Oh... Buttercup gasped. Oh, oh dear. Now the farm boy was staring back at the countess. He was feeding the cows and his muscles were rippling the way they always did under his tan skin, and Buttercup was standing there watching as the farm boy looked, for the first time, deep into the countess's eyes. Buttercup jumped out of bed and began to pace her room. How could he? Oh, it was all right if he looked at her, but he wasn't looking at her. He was looking at her. She's so old, Buttercup muttered, starting to storm a bit now. The Countess would never see thirty again, and that was fact. And her dress looked ridiculous out in the cowshed, and that was fact, too. Buttercup fell onto her bed and clutched her pillow across her breast. The dress was ridiculous before it ever got to the cowshed. The Countess looked rotten the minute she left the carriage, with her too big painted mouth and her little piggy painted eyes and her powdered skin and... 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 Flailing and thrashing, Buttercup wept and tossed and paced and wept some more, and there have been three great cases of jealousy since David of Galilee was first afflicted with the emotion when he could no longer stand the fact that his neighbor Saul's cactus outshone his own. Originally, jealous pertained solely to plants, other people's cactuses or ginkgos, or later, when there was grass, grass, which is why, even to this day, we say that someone is green with jealousy." Buttercup's case rated a close fourth on the all-time list. It was a very long and very green night. She was outside his hovel before dawn. Inside, she could hear him already awake. She knocked. He appeared, stood in the doorway. Behind him, she could see a tiny candle, open books. He waited. She looked at him. Then she looked away. He was too beautiful. I love you, Buttercup said. I know this must come as something of a surprise, since all I've ever done is scorn you and degrade you and taunt you, but I've loved you for several hours now, and every second more. I thought an hour ago that I loved you more than any woman has ever loved a man, but a half hour after that I knew that what I felt before was nothing compared to what I felt then. But ten minutes after that I understood that my previous love was a puddle compared to the high seas before a storm. Your eyes are like that, did you know? Well, they are. How many minutes ago was I? Twenty? Had I brought my feelings up to then? It doesn't matter. Buttercup still could not look at him. The sun was rising behind her now. She could feel the heat on her back, and it gave her courage. I love you so much more now than twenty minutes ago that there cannot be comparison. I love you so much more now than when you opened your hovel door there cannot be comparison. There is no room in my body for anything but you. My arms love you, my ears adore you, my knees shake with blind affection, my mind begs you to ask it something so it can obey. Do you want me to follow you for the rest of your days? I will do that. Do you want me to crawl? I will crawl. I will be quiet for you or sing for you, or if you are hungry, let me bring you food. Or if you have thirst and nothing will quench it but Arabian wine, I will go to Araby, even though it is across the world, and bring a bottle back for your lunch. Anything there is that I can do for you, I will do for you. Anything there is that I cannot do, I will learn to do. 
I know I cannot compete with the Countess in skills or wisdom or appeal, and I saw the way she looked at you, and I saw the way you looked at her. But remember, please, that she is old and has other interests, while I am seventeen, and for me there is only you. Dearest Wesley, I've never called you that before, have I? Wesley, 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 darling Wesley, adored Wesley, sweet, perfect Wesley, whisper that I have a chance to win your love. And with that, she dared the bravest thing she'd ever done. She looked right into his eyes. He closed the door in her face. Without a word. Without a word. Buttercup ran. She whirled and burst away, and the tears came bitterly. She could not see. She stumbled. She slammed into a tree trunk, fell, rose, ran on. Her shoulder throbbed from where the tree trunk hit her, and the pain was strong, but not enough to ease her shattered heart. Back to her room she fled, back to her pillow. Safe behind the locked door, she drenched the world with tears. Not even one word. He hadn't had the decency for that. Sorry, he could have said. Would it have ruined him to say sorry? Too late, he could have said. Why couldn't he at least have said something? Buttercup thought very hard about that for a moment, and suddenly she had the answer. He didn't talk, because the minute he opened his mouth, that was it. Sure, he was handsome, but dumb? The minute he had exercised his tongue, it would have all been over. Duh. That's what he would have said. That was the kind of thing Wesley came out with when he was feeling really sharp. Duh, thanks, Buttercup. Buttercup dried her tears and began to smile. She took a deep breath, heaved a sigh. It was all part of growing up. You got these little quick passions, you blinked and they were gone. You forgave faults, found perfection, fell madly. Then the next day the sun came up and it was over. Chalk it up to experience, old girl, and get on with the morning. Buttercup stood, made her bed, changed her clothes, combed her hair, smiled, and burst out again in a fit of weeping, because there was a limit to just how much you could lie to yourself. Wesley wasn't stupid. Oh, she could pretend he was. She could laugh about his difficulties with the language. She could chide herself for her silly infatuation with a dullard. The truth was simply this. He had a head on his shoulders, with a brain inside every bit as good as his teeth. There was a reason he hadn't spoken, and it had nothing to do with gray cells working. He hadn't spoken because, really, there was nothing for him to say. He didn't love her back, and that was that. The tears that kept Buttercup company the remainder of the day were not at all like those that had blinded her into the tree trunk. Those were noisy and hot. They pulsed. These were silent and steady, and all they did was remind her that she wasn't good enough. She was seventeen, and every male she'd ever known had crumbled at her feet, and it meant nothing. The one time it mattered, she wasn't good enough. All she knew, really, was riding, and how was that to interest a man when that man had been looked at by the Countess? It was dusk when she heard footsteps outside her door, then a knock. Buttercup dried her eyes. Another knock. "'Whoever is that?' Buttercup yawned finally. "'Wesley.' Buttercup lounged across the bed. "'Wesley?' she said. "'Do I know any Wes—' "'Oh, farm boy, it's you. How droll!' She went to her door, unlocked it, and said in her fanciest tone, "'I'm ever so glad you stopped by. I've been feeling just ever so slummy about the little joke I played on you this morning. Of course you knew I wasn't for a moment serious, or at least I thought you knew, but then, just when you started closing the door, I thought for one dreary instant that perhaps I'd done my little jest just a bit too convincingly, and poor dear thing, you might have thought I meant what I said, when of course we both know the total impossibility of that ever happening. I've come to say goodbye.' Buttercup's heart bucked, but she still held to fancy. "'You're going to sleep, you mean, and you've come to say good night? How thoughtful of you, farm boy, showing me that you forgive me for my little morning's tease. I certainly appreciate your thoughtfulness, and—' He cut her off. "'I'm leaving.' "'Leaving?' The floor began to ripple. She held to the door frame. "'Now?' "'Yes.' "'Because of what I said this morning?' "'Yes.' "'I frightened you away, didn't I? I could kill my tongue.' She shook her head and shook her head. Well, it's done. You've made your decision. Just remember this. I won't take you back when she's done with you. I don't care if you beg. He just looked at her. Buttercup hurried on. Just because you're beautiful and perfect, it's made you conceited. You think people can't get tired of you. Well, you're wrong. They can. And she will. Besides, you're too poor. I'm going to America to seek my fortune. This was just after America, but long after fortunes. A ship sails soon from London. There is great opportunity in America. I'm going to take advantage of it. I've been training myself. 
in my hovel. I've taught myself not to need sleep, a few hours only. I'll take a ten-hour-a-day job, and then I'll take another ten-hour-a-day job, and I'll save every penny from both except when I need to eat to keep strong. And when I have enough, I'll buy a farm and build a house and make a bed big enough for two. You're just crazy if you think she's going to be happy in some run-down farmhouse in America, not with what she spends on clothes. Stop talking about the Countess, as a special favor, before you drive me mad. Buttercup looked at him. Don't you understand anything that's going on? Buttercup shook her head. Wesley shook his, too. You've never been the brightest, I guess. Do you love me, Wesley? Is that it? He couldn't believe it. Do I love you? My God, if your love were a grain of sand, mine would be a universe of beaches. If your love were- I don't understand that first one yet, Buttercup interrupted. She was starting to get very excited now. Let me get this straight. Are you saying my love is the size of a grain of sand and yours is this other thing? Images just confuse me so. Is this universal business of yours bigger than my sand? Help me, Wesley. I have the feeling we're on the verge of something just terribly important. I have stayed these years in my hovel because of you. I have taught myself languages because of you. I have made my body strong because I thought you might be pleased by my strong body. I have lived my life with only the prayer that some sudden dawn you might glance in my direction. I have not known a moment in years when the sight of you did not send my heart careening against my ribcage. I have not known a night when your visage did not accompany me to sleep. There has not been a morning when you did not flutter behind my waking eyelids. Is any of this getting through to you, Buttercup, or do you want me to go on for a while? Never stop. There has not been- If you're teasing me, Wesley, I'm just going to kill you. How can you even dream I might be teasing? Well, you haven't once said you loved me. That's all you need? Easy. I love you. Okay? Want it louder? I love you. Spell it out, should I? I-L-O-V-E-Y-O-U. Want it backward? You love I. You're teasing me now, aren't you? A little, maybe. I've been saying it so long to you, you just wouldn't listen. Every time you said, farm boy, do this, you thought I was answering as you wish, but that's only because you were hearing wrong. I love you was what it was, but you never heard, and you never heard. I hear you now, and I promise you this, I will never love anyone else, only Wesley, until I die. He nodded, took a step away. I'll send for you soon, believe me. Would my Wesley ever lie? He took another step. I'm late. I must go. I hate it, but I must. The ship sails soon, and London is far. I understand. He reached out with his right hand. Buttercup found it very hard to breathe. Goodbye. She managed to raise her right hand to his. They shook. Goodbye, he said again. She made a little nod. He took a third step, not turning. She watched him. He turned and the words ripped out of her. Without one kiss? They fell into each other's arms. There have been five great kisses since 1642 BC, when Saul and Delilah Korn's inadvertent discovery swept across Western civilization. Before then, couples hooked thumbs. And the precise rating of kisses is a terribly difficult thing, often leading to great controversy, because although everyone agrees with the formula of affection times purity times intensity times duration, no one has ever been completely satisfied with how much weight each element should receive. But on any system, there are five that everyone agrees deserve full marks. Well, this one left them all behind. The first morning after Wesley's departure, Buttercup thought she was entitled to do nothing more than sit around moping and feeling sorry for herself. After all, the love of her life had fled. Life had no meaning. How could you face the future, etc., etc. But after about two seconds of that, she realized that Wesley was out in the world now, getting nearer and nearer to London, and what if a beautiful city girl caught his fancy while she was just back here moldering? Or worse, what if he got to America and worked his jobs and built his farm and made their bed and sent for her, and when he got there he would look at her and say, I'm sending you back, the moping has destroyed your eyes, and self-pity has taken your skin. You're a slobby-looking creature, I'm marrying an Indian girl who lives in a teepee nearby and is always in the peak of condition. Buttercup ran to her bedroom mirror. Oh, Wesley, she said, I must never disappoint you. And she hurried downstairs to where her parents were squabbling. Sixteen to thirteen, and not past breakfast yet. I need your advice, she interrupted. What can I do to improve my personal appearance? Start by bathing, her father said. 
And do something with your hair while you're at it, her mother said. Unearth the territory behind your ears. Neglect not your knees. That will do nicely for starters, Buttercup said. She shook her head. Gracious, but it isn't easy being tidy. Undaunted, she set to work. Every morning she awoke, if possible, by dawn, and got the farm chores finished immediately. There was much to be done now with Wesley gone, and more than that, ever since the Count had visited, everyone in the area had increased his milk order, so there was no time for self-improvement until well into the afternoon. But then she really set to work. First a good cold bath. Then, while her hair was drying, she would slave after fixing her figure faults. One of her elbows was just too bony, the opposite wrist not bony enough and exercise what remained of her baby fat, little left now, she was nearly eighteen, and brush and brush her hair. Her hair was the color of autumn, and it had never been cut, so a thousand strokes took time, but she didn't mind, because Wesley had never seen it clean like this, and wouldn't he be surprised when she stepped off the boat in America? Her skin was the color of wintry cream, and she scrubbed her every inch well past glistening, and that wasn't much fun, really, but wouldn't Wesley be pleased with how clean she was as she stepped off the boat in America? And very quickly now, her potential began to be realized. From 20th, she jumped within two weeks to 15th, an unheard of change in such a time. But three weeks after that, she was already ninth and moving. The competition was tremendous now, but the day after she was ninth, a three-page letter arrived from Wesley in London, and just reading it over put her up to eighth. This was really what was doing it for her more than anything. Her love for Wesley would not stop growing, and people were dazzled when she delivered milk in the morning. Some people were only able to gape at her, but many talked, and those that did found her warmer and gentler than she had ever been before. Even the village girls would nod and smile now, and some of them would ask after Wesley, which was a mistake unless you happened to have a lot of spare time, because when someone asked Buttercup how Wesley was, well, she told them. He was supreme as usual, he was spectacular, he was singularly fabulous. Oh, she could go on for hours. Sometimes it got a little tough for the listeners to maintain strict attention, but they did their best, since Buttercup loved him so completely. Which was why Wesley's death hit her the way it did. He had written to her just before he sailed for America. The Queen's pride was his ship, and he loved her. That was the way his sentences always went. It is raining today, and I love you. My cold is better, and I love you. Say hello to horse, and I love you. Like that. Then there were no letters, but that was natural. He was at sea. Then she heard. She came home from delivering the milk, and her parents were wooden. Off the Carolina coast her father whispered. Her mother whispered, without warning, at night. What? From Buttercup. Pirates, said her father. Buttercup thought she'd better sit down. Quiet in the room. He's been taken prisoner then? Buttercup managed. Her mother made a no. It was Roberts, her father said, the dread pirate Roberts. Oh, Buttercup said, the one who never leaves survivors. Yes, her father said, quiet in the room. Suddenly Buttercup was talking very fast. Was he stabbed? Did he drown? Did they cut his throat asleep? Did they wake him, do you suppose? Perhaps they whipped him dead. She stood up then. I'm getting silly, forgive me. She shook her head, as if the way they got him mattered. Excuse me, please. With that, she hurried to her room. She stayed there many days. At first her parents tried to lure her, but she would not have it. They took to leaving food outside her room, and she took bits and shreds, enough to stay alive. There was never noise inside, no wailing, no bitter sounds. And when she at last came out, her eyes were dry. Her parents stared up from their silent breakfast at her. They both started to rise, but she put a hand out, stopped them. I can care for myself, please, and she said about getting some food. They watched her closely. In point of fact, she had never looked as well. She had entered her room just as an impossibly lovely girl. The woman who emerged was a trifle thinner, a great deal wiser, an ocean sadder. This one understood the nature of pain, and beneath the glory of her features there was character and a sure knowledge of suffering. She was eighteen. She was the most beautiful woman in a hundred years. She didn't seem to care. "'You're all right?' her mother asked. Buttercup sipped her cocoa. Fine, she said. You're sure? Her father wondered. Yes, Buttercup replied. 
There was a very long pause. But I must never love again. She never did. <laughs>